16 years ago. I came back home 16 years ago and we, we talked about all the work that you see in town today, the Commons, um, the Learning Centre, um, and they asked me, 16 years ago, they asked me, how long do you think it'll take to do this? I said, five years. And here we are 16 years later and we're not done yet. We still got more, so. Coming, I would have shaved. I'm joking. So quiet on set. Action. Okay, nice to meet you too. My name is Keith, Keith Wolfsmarch from Car Cross. Carver, artist. It started off. Um, when I was about five or when I was about six or seven years old, I was in school and I watched a film, and, it, and the film is a National Film Board production, and it was called Paddle to the Sea. Some of you might have seen it. It was called Paddle to the Sea, about this little young Indian boy sitting in the cabin, and he carved a little canoe with a man in it, uh, with a little Indian man in it, and he put it on the on the ice, and and he carved in the bottom, put me back in the water, and his dream was to have this little canoe go all the way, float all the way to the ocean. And so this film um, uh, documents the, this little canoe's journey. And But when I was watching that movie, the film, I could hear the wood cutting as he was carving. And he was contemplating this dream. And the whole the whole world didn't matter to him, but his, his carving and this, this dream of this. And so throughout the film, the, the little canoe and the, with the man in it eventually makes it all the way to the ocean. It starts on the little creeks and goes through big rivers and dams and and so that really uh, impacted me that he had this this he had this dream and he was carving it and uh, and uh, it happened and then second when I was about 13 years old um, my father showed me a postcard of Skookum Jim's last great potlatch and I'm sure you've all seen the picture I got a copy of it right up there and in the photograph everybody's wearing regalia. Um, there's even a mask in there. Um, there's a there's a small totem pole and there's some carvings. And I asked my parents, where where is all this? Because I was raised here in Carcross and, and there was no culture, there was no art. And both my parents said, well, it's that's history. It's gone. It, it you know it disappeared when the gold rush came. Everything changed. When I was about uh, 18 years old, um, I read a book and I realized that Clinkett's traditionally carved. Before that, I didn't know that. And so it was then I, I made up my mind and I started uh, seeking out teachers and I met my teacher and it just, I just devoted all my time and efforts to, to become a carver. I always wanted to be a carver since uh, six years old. Well, see, you know, um, Totem poles aren't, weren't really um, traditional here. We didn't do totem poles before. I was the first one to start doing totem poles. And, um, and the reason for that is um, we're made up of two tribes here, as, as you know. We're made up of the Tagish and the Clinket. The Tagish were here in Carcross first. Um, and the Clinket started coming in about 250 years ago through the Chilkoot Trail trading with us. So we would uh, trade furs. And, and today I'm, I'm still a trapper. I, we still trap. And so we would trade furs to the Clinkets. The Clinkets would take it out to the coast and they were trading with the ships at that time, the, the, with the Russians, the Americans and the British. And um, so they would bring trade goods into us. And over time, we intermarried these two tribes to solidify that trading. Um, and even to, like my grandmother was Tagish, my grandfather was Clinket. My grandfather was born in Juneau. And he was carried inland over the Chilkoot Trail when he was two years old by my great grandmother. Um, so it was the Clinkets that brought the artwork in. Um, as um, Tagish people, we were nomadic, you know, we lived with the seasons. We had to feed ourselves and we, we came to Carcrest here twice a year to, to get the caribou when they crossed the river here. And so it was the Clinkets that actually brought the, the uh, artwork in. And over time, because we're a clan system, we adopted all those clans and all those clan symbols. And so now we have an hereditary right to, to these who are like our clan poles. And so that's, 
That's, I, I even question myself at some times, why am I doing totem poles? And um, it's just in my blood. And, and, and we have we an have, uh, inherent right to those poles. So I decided to start doing totem poles. <clears throat> Actually, I went to Japan. Oh, yeah. Yep. Uh, I first went to Japan in 1988, and I went there to study uh, wood carving with a, with a Japanese carver. No, uh, what happened was um, I have a we had a mutual friend, a friend that li was from the Yukon, and so when he returned back to Japan, uh, he just casually mentioned this to his landlord, and his landlord's cousin was a carver, and his name was uh, Haruki Fuji. And so she immediately picked up the phone and just blurted out that there's a carver in the Yukon that would like to come over and he said, bring him over. And so it was a matter of, um, matter of uh, almost not even a week, I got a phone call and they said, come on over. And so I just had to, um, I wrote and got some grants. It took me a couple of months. And eventually uh, it was in May of, May of 1988. And I always like to tell the story that I went from Tesla to Tokyo, but, because before that, I, I hadn't even gone to Vancouver. So it was really culture shock to fly from Tesla to Tokyo. It, it varies. It varies on the, on the prices. I don't really want to say prices. <laughs> but um, it, um, we usually sell by the foot when, we, when we're commissioned to do a totem pole. Gosh. Uh, I think working in the sawmill, my first job. And I remember working in the sawmill, and uh, I was at a part, uh, I, my job was, um, I would take these big pieces of wood and run them through a, another cutter, and I would cut pieces off, and they would drop to the side, and I was supposed to throw them away. And I was finding all these interesting pieces of wood, so I was keeping them, stacking them up, and I was actually taking them back to my bunkhouse room and, and trying to make stuff with them. So I was always attracted to wood. <clears throat> So this is the design. Um, again, I get direction from uh, Chief and Council and Elders Council, and um, they didn't want any clan symbols. So this represents a human, a man. Um, so if you can see, you see his head is here, the head. This is his body, um, his shoulder, and down to his arm and his hand. And then this way is his, his thigh and his, his shin and his foot. And then there's the doorway there, his stomach. Eventually, um, we're gonna do one for the other end of the learning center. We're gonna have one at each end, and the other one will represent a woman. And then the colors, we always use this, normally we use three colors, uh, red, black, and blue. Red represents uh, life, blood. Um, black is protection. Like some people, when you go to a funeral or something, wear black. Well, in the old days, we used to paint our face completely black, and then, uh, the blue uh, represents, um, it's usually decorative for clinkets or wealth because it came from copper oxide, the blue. Um, the red came from red ochre and the black came from charcoal. And, and sometimes we use white. Um, yeah. Oh, and the, the open hands, whenever you see the open hands on our, our carvings or our poles or our designs, it's a sign of peace. It means I come, no weapons. This was a log, and we milled the log up. Uh, we milled it up. It took two months to dry it, the boards out. I had all the boards lined up in here. I would come in, we had the heat turned right down here, and I would come in every day and flip the boards because they would, they would warp. And then we uh, run them through a, a planer on one side and a, a drum sander, and we matched all the, uh, the grains and colors as best we could, and then we glued it all together. Um, and then we painted it. I think it took two weeks to paint it. Um, and the reason, we did it in sections so we can handle it. Um, after we paint it, then we carve it. As you can see, I'm carving this now. Um, we can't really, um, we can't, we, we rough sketch it in, and then we rough paint it in. And then what we do afterwards is we clean up all the lines with the knife. Because it's easier to, you can't paint a straight line as well as you can carve a straight line. Um, so traditionally we had, um, the clinkets in the longhouses would always have a dance screen. For the dancers, and then we're going to cut a we're going to cut a doorway out of this out of the center, and they call that the belly or the womb, and the dancers will actually 
enter and exit out of the, the doorway. Um, some chiefs, some chiefs on the coast in their houses, they, they had a permanent screen right in their house and they would live behind the screen. And so they would actually, that was the doorway. With our designs, uh, there's rules to them. There's strict rules to our designs and, and I'm a traditionalist. Um, red and black never touch, only in the fine points. Only uh, something like this, black will only touch here. And uh, this design was uh, meant to be carved because uh, the way we carve it, um, we use the wood as a third color sometime or a fourth color, we balance it with the wood. And red and black are usually uh, form line. Um, it could be red or it could be black. Um, primary and secondary and blue is tertiary. Blue is only put on after you've carved it. The shapes, the most common shape in our, in our, in our art is the, uh, the, the ovoid is the foundation of our art. And there's, there's a couple theories where that shape came from. One is, uh, it could be a clamshell. Um, another one is when you look on the ocean from the shore, you see the, you see the ocean horizon and the sky. And then the other one is, this is my theory, is if you go like this, you make a perfect ovoid. And that's the one I, I, I believe in. Um, second of all is um, U-shapes, simply because they look like a U. We call them U-shapes. Um, and then we have um, uh, crescents inside. I don't think I have a crescent here. Well, yeah, crescents are breaks. When we, we call this, a, these are crescents. That's a crescent. It's just a break. Um, and then there's S shapes because they look like S, they look like S's. Um, yeah, that's uh, and um, it took me uh, it took me ten years to to uh, understand the design, to really understand it and, and uh, master it. And then after after ten years, you start trying to develop your own style, staying within the rules. Um, all of us carvers and artists, we use the same components, we have the same rules, and it's really. It's, it's hard to develop your own style so people can recognize your style. It takes a long, long time. Um, I can, like I said, I've been carving professionally over 35 years now, and I, I feel like I'm, I'm finally developing my style. Is we're gonna do a big sign for, for the uh, subdivision near the Carcross Cutoff, and in Clinkit, it means Caribou Crossing, so I'm gonna do a big sign with the Caribou uh, design, and uh, yeah, so, the sign is next. I still have to do two totem poles for the commons, and then we're going to do a totem pole for um, the old Chutla School residential site. I suggested to Chief and Council that we do a, a small pole for the skate park and get youth involved in that. And so I have a couple more years of work here left here yet before I'm done. I work um, basically nine to five here doing work for Carcross Tagus First Nation. And then uh, at nights and weekends, I do my private commissions. So this past year, I've been almost in here seven days a week and nights, so. but I'm enjoying it. Uh, my life, my, my carving career was a, the first 20 years was a struggle, like any artist. You know, I literally starved sometimes. Uh, I had to get a job washing dishes one time. To, uh, to feed me and I was a single parent. Um, now, the, where I'm at in my uh, career is like dream time for me. So now I can do what I, what I feel like I want to do. So it's, I'm really having a lot of fun now. And I'm really enjoying what I'm doing. I have no worries about the future or, or, or uh, when I'm in here, I, I, I get into a zone. Um, I'm in here for about a half an hour, an hour, and, and I get into a zone and I don't even, sometimes, Sometimes, sometimes it feels like I just got here and I'll leave at nine o'clock at night, you know, so it's really enjoyable. And it's not always like that. Some, um, when I'm working on some projects, once the idea and the concept up here, I work it out in my mind, then the fun is over. And then it's work, it's labor. I just gotta carve it then, you know, but it's, it's a challenge to, to try and put it together and, and make those things work. Um, most carving happens two ways, either, I see it right there and it's got to come out of the wood and I can, can't put that piece down. Other times I have to draw it and coax it out and it, it takes a long time to get it out so it works two ways. So I always call it magic. 
because some days the magic works and some days it doesn't. So. Till I can't carve anymore, I guess, is a good way to put it. Um, I've been carving over 35 years professionally now. Um, I started carving as a small boy and I'm, I'm really grateful to uh, been able to make a life out of it. I'm a trapper and a hunter and a fisherman and I think for retirement I would I would like to do something um, in the outdoors and just enjoy myself out there. Um, one of my dreams is to go and live for an entire year or two years on the land. Maybe we'll cut there. You're going to interview Thomas? Oh, I'm sorry. I knew he was going to say that. <laughs> That's why I said it. I knew he'd say that. <laughs> You're welcome. Awesome. Good. Hope you got something there you could use. How's your dad? Oh, I got the thing on. Oh. oh. Ah.